Welcome to the English with Kirsty podcast from www.englishwithkirsty.com. Here I'll be sharing with you tips, information and other learning resources so that you can improve your business English. And welcome to episode 153 of the English with Kirsty podcast. And today I want to talk about something that I started thinking about at the weekend because I was writing a message to a friend and I thought, oh, I'm going to have to check this word now because I, I don't know how you spell it. It wouldn't have really mattered. I'm sure my friend wouldn't have cared if I'd made a mistake because it was obvious what I meant. But I like to do things properly, so I had to look it up. And it made me think, I, yeah, I have a problem with double letters sometimes. Do Does this word need a double letter or not? Um, words like even even the title of this podcast, Habit, has one B, Rabbit has two Bs, and they sound exactly the same, Habit, Rabbit, um, and there's no logical rule to follow whether you need one or two letters there, and often words like accommodation. I don't have a problem with accommodation, but um, some people do, and it's because of these double letters that trip people up, so I was just thinking, yeah, that for me, that's a thing that I need to check. Um, and a spell check can usually usually fix things like that. Um, sometimes you have other problems that the spell check can't fix, but something like that. If I know I, I check my work through before I send it out or emails, um, then I will catch things like that. Um, but we all have things that we have to think about a bit more than other people. And for everybody, it will be different. And I was thinking, actually, knowing about these things, rather than just thinking, you oh, I'm not very good at that, it's actually good to know about these things because then you can pay special attention to them when you're writing um, just to make sure, you know, double check those things because you know they are the things that will catch you out. Um, and sometimes it's something you can just do on your own. Sometimes it is worth getting someone else to do it for you. So one of the general pieces of advice that are given out about checking your work is get someone else to read it. Um, and I think that's a good thing. If it's an important document, um, if it's something that a lot of people will see, maybe if it's something that's not in your native language, I do get uh, German native speakers to check some of my stuff if it's not just for an email that I'm writing to someone but if it's something important then I will ask a native speaker to look at that for me because why not if they can give me some feedback that will help me then that's a good thing it's not a sign of weakness um, I think the problem comes you can't do that all the time or people will get fed up with you so you need to have a, a system for prioritizing and thinking okay yeah this is really important this is this is maybe important but it's it needs to get done quickly and I can do it myself so I think in certainly with things like I don't know when I was writing my book I know that one of my things that I'm rubbish at is formatting I'm just not good at it um, especially if I'm working with other people on something I can't um, it's to do with my visual impairment mainly but I can't automatically notice if something is in a slightly different font size or a different font or is if the bold has gone too far down you know, like if it's taken a line of text that shouldn't be in bold or underline I'm just not there are ways for people with a vision impairment to check that but you check it by character and something wouldn't just stand out to me as wrong as it would to somebody who can see it um, so I try to pay special attention to that I don't always <laughs> succeed um, but generally I do and if it's something important then I will ask somebody to check it for me I generally get someone to check my newsletters um, if it's if I'm in a real hurry and it has to get done quickly then then perhaps not but but usually I do ask someone to check that because I know I'm bad at it and I can try but I'll probably always be not the best at it so sometimes you just need to accept help but other times with things like my double letters or I'm thinking about when I speak German now I know that I often make mistakes with adjective endings and I'm, I'm not going to explain here how the German language works and how it's different to English but if you have an adjective um, then your adjective has to match your noun that it's describing and there are different ways that you do that depending on what kind of role your noun is playing in the sentence and I know how to do them I had to give a presentation on how to do them at school and my presentation was right but there's something about them that I, I always have to look at it twice and think oh, is that right is that should it be like that and I know that sometimes I will make mistakes with them 
and that's annoying. But because I know about that, then I can I can check it out and I can make sure that they're right, pay special attention to them. So I wanted to see these things that we know that we struggle with as opportunities and not just, oh, I'm no good at that. But actually, yeah, that can help me because I know I make these kind of problem, make these kind of mistakes and they can be a problem for me. So I'll just spend a bit more time checking them. And then I thought about other things that people might have as their things that they want to spend a bit more time checking because it will be different for everybody. Um, I do have a list of 10 things here in, in addition to my own because I've, I've mentioned a couple of mine. So the double letters, the formatting, the adjective endings if I'm speaking German. But then I've got some other things here that you may just want to pay a bit more attention to if it's something that you struggle with. And it will be different for everyone. So you may say yes to a couple of these or none of these. You may have a completely different thing. But um, yeah, here are my 10. So yeah, spelling. Spell checks are great, but they don't catch everything, especially if the word that you write um, is, is a word. Like people often write um, defiantly instead of definitely. Defiantly is a word. The spell check is not going to pick that up. But if you're defiantly going to do something, it's different to definitely going to do something. So, you know, words like that. And if you have, I don't know, where and where, if you mix things like that up or, you know, words that sound similar and are actual words, the spell check is not going to pick that up. Um, so spell check is great, but you also have to, to read through things and sometimes read them aloud just to make sure that what you've written is actually what you what you meant to say. Um, punctuation. Sometimes people struggle with punctuation. Um, they have problems with the apostrophe, for example. Are you sure about where it should go? Because sometimes when I'm proofreading, especially for native speakers, and a lot of these things are things that apply equally to native speakers, um, because contrary to what people may think, just because somebody's a native speaker, it doesn't mean that they always write well or that they, that they think about all the, these things. So often when I'm looking at, at documents for native speakers, I have to do a lot of work with correcting punctuation, apostrophes, um, commas. Some people seem to have this aversion to commas, which means that they don't put any commas in. And it's it's the sentences are quite hard to read because they just carry on like one big long snake with no commas to to insert pauses there. That's not the only reason why we have commas, but they do break up your sentence. And if you don't use any, then you can have some really long sentences which don't make a lot of sense because the punctuation is missing. So, um, yeah, are you sure about where to put your commas? If, if it's something that you find difficult, then, you know, have an, have spend a bit more time looking at that. Um, and then other small things like um, brackets if you open them have you closed them if you open speech marks have you closed them because yeah that's just kind of untidy isn't it but it's easily done um but it's it also comes under this whole um heading of punctuation and, and problems people have with punctuation um another thing is just a more general thing that, that no spell check or or anything like that will help you with it's the structure so can you can somebody follow what you wanted to say with your document can somebody follow your thoughts um, and understand your thought process, what you wanted them to do, um, or does it jump around as soon as a new thought came into your head, you jump to that. Um, it may make sense to you, but if somebody came in and started reading this document with no knowledge of, of what you were thinking, would it, would it make sense to them as well? And sometimes that is a good opportunity to ask somebody to help you because you may not always be able to judge that, but if you take on board the feedback that they give you, maybe it will help you for next time when you're doing something similar. Um, uses of tenses. Now, this doesn't tend to be the native speakers. This is more something that learners do. But sometimes your own language can interfere too much with the with your writing in another language. So it can be for tenses, but it can also be for expressions. You know, like if you translate an expression directly out of your native language and we don't have this expression in English, then it sounds a bit strange. If somebody else, like if, if a German person does this, I often know what they mean because I speak German, but another English speaker might not because we, we don't have this expression in English. So um, it is around tenses. Um, it can be like if, if your native language prefers a certain tense, over another when you're talking about something maybe in the past or um, a hypothetical question or sentence. If you build them in a certain way in your native language and then you do that exactly the same way in English, it might not be right because that might not be the way that we generally do it in English. So um, 
I, I started off talking about tenses, but really it's how your native language interferes with your thought process if, if your native language isn't English. So um, that's one thing to look out for that sometimes people do and that sometimes makes it harder to understand what they want to say. Uh, very long sentences. I complain about this a lot, um, <laughs> particularly in more academic writing. Some of my students want to, you know, break free from this idea of writing like um like a child I guess with very short sentences um, but there's an art to writing longer sentences and if you just stick three shorter sentences together and hope for the best it, it won't work well for you generally um, because sometimes it it's it's better for the the piece of writing in itself to have some medium sentences rather than really long ones because if somebody has to read your sentence two or three times to even understand what you wanted to say then that is not helpful you're wasting their time and you're probably going to make them annoyed with you for wasting their time and rather than thinking how smart you are for writing such long sentences they'll just think that you're really annoying for making them have to read the sentence three or four times to understand what you even wanted to say and that's not good so be aware of that you know length of sentence doesn't necessarily mean that um, something sounds good or that you've really put a lot of thought into it. Um, run on sentences. I will talk about this perhaps in another post. Um, and it's not, it's not bad, but it's just not great practice. Sometimes people sandwich two shorter sentences together with a comma and um, they're related. So you can see why they would belong in the same sentence often. Um, but there's no joining word to make them fit together nicely. So, and because, you know, things things that make it, it flow as one sentence um, are needed. Otherwise, you just have two short sentences. It's, they don't automatically fit together um, just because you, you put a comma there and, and thought, well, it's the same kind of idea, then they can fit together. Um, they don't always. Sometimes they might be better as two two shorter sentences or you need to rearrange the sentence slightly so that it has a word that shows why these two these two points are together is it because they they mean the same thing or is it giving a reason for something is it is it making a contrast you know there are lots of different things that you can do with joining words but sometimes we need a bit more of a clue why the two sentences are together um, and a comma doesn't give that clue it, it just means that you've um, added two shorter sentences together into one where they don't really belong together. Um, words that are often confused, that also happens um, to native speakers and non-native speakers. If there's a word that looks similar or sounds similar or has several spellings of the same word, each meaning something different, it's easily done. And again, these often won't get picked up because they are actual words. It's just not necessarily the word that you want to have. So watch out for those. Um, double negatives, some languages, um, speakers of some languages do this more than others, but then again, some native speakers do this as well. So it's not just about having another language. Um, in some languages, double negatives are normal and it's what you should do. And if you're learning those languages, then like English speakers will forget to do it because it's incorrect to say, I didn't see nobody, but in some languages you, you do have to say nobody. But if, if you have a negative already, like didn't, um, then you don't need another negative like nobody. So I didn't see, no, didn't see anybody. I didn't buy anything, not I didn't buy nothing. Um, I didn't go anywhere, not I didn't go nowhere. So watch out for double negatives if that's something that you do. Maybe you don't and you can completely ignore this point. Um, these are just 10 different examples of, of things that people sometimes do. Um, another thing that sometimes people do is changing um, so they start a document by talking about maybe they're talking about a course and they talk about the course participants, what they will learn, what they will be able to do at the end of the course, for example. But somewhere in the middle, it goes to you and you will be able to do this and you will have this knowledge. And then it goes back to the course participants and they will. And so change between you and they when you're speaking to somebody in a, in a business document. It's not good. It just looks untidy. So choose one. If you are directly speaking to your customers, then fine, say you, but don't switch between you and they because it gets it gets a bit confusing and it doesn't look tidy. So if that's something that you sometimes do, then you can watch out for that. Um, yeah, this is easy, easily done. Um, missing words. You, you think you're thinking quickly and you're maybe typing quickly and you think you've written the words, but some of them aren't there. 
And it's really hard to catch because sometimes when you're reading through a document, if you're reading it quickly, you kind of see the words that are not there sometimes. You, you think they're there because um, because you want to make sense of what you're reading, so you still don't catch it. But um, sometimes if, if this is something that you're likely to do, then just check, check through the document again, maybe read it aloud and then just read the words that you see and then you'll see if there are some missing words or even missing letters um, because yeah sometimes if you miss a letter it will still be a word as we mentioned earlier but it's usually the smaller words that, that get missed out because they're you know they're just small words and it's easy to overlook them when you're focusing on the, the longer words but yeah sometimes if you have words that are missing people will understand it but they'll think oh what happened to those words and then it will distract them from the rest of what you're trying to say um, and that's another thing with the the missing words is also missing spaces. I I don't know whether it's because of the type of keyboard that I'm using, but I, I notice I do that more now. And I have um, I had a student who who did it quite a lot as well. Um, the spaces were missing after the full stop, or sometimes between. Usually between two words doesn't happen as much, but certainly after a full stop or after a comma. You press the space and it somehow doesn't register or you just don't press it hard enough or whatever it is. If you're typing quickly, um, you can end up with a load of missing spaces. And I, I do that as well. So that should have been on my list, too. And that usually gets picked up with the spell check as well. But it's worth looking at because it does look a bit um, a bit careless, I guess, if, if you don't catch those missing spaces and put them back in. So a lot of the time, this is nothing to do with the content or the vocabulary or anything. It's just these little things that can make your document look not quite as good as it could have if you'd made these checks. And I don't expect everyone here to look for all of these 10 things in their documents because that's not really the point here. The point is that everybody is different and everybody is more likely to do some things than others. Um, so if I know that I don't do something, well, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to spend lots of extra time looking at that point but if I know that something is something that's likely to trip me up or to cause me a problem then yeah let that work for me I'll, I'll just spend a little bit more time making sure I haven't done that in, in an important document so rather than saying oh these are 10 things that people shouldn't do I don't want it to be like that I just want it to be okay what what things are you likely to do that would make your document a bit harder to read or not look quite as good or things that you always um, always make you think or things that often you realize oh I should have done that again you know what are those things and then just spend a little bit more time on those when you're producing something that you know other people are going to read so I've given some ideas there but there are so many more I wanted to stop at 10 because otherwise it was going to get a really long podcast and I've also written a uh, an article about this on my blog which I will link to the show notes page which will be for this episode will be englishwithkirsty.com slash podcast slash episode 153 and from there you can contact me if you want to suggest any other things um, you can also sign up for the newsletter and you can also um, see the link to the article that I wrote about this as well so those are just 10 things maybe you have some ideas for more if you've got another idea let me know or but really it's just about you if you have an idea of something you do then you can just be a bit more aware of that in future so i hope that was helpful have a good week and have fun learning english i hope you enjoyed this episode of the english with kirsty podcast if you have any questions or comments my email address is kirsty at englishwithkirsty.com go to www.englishwithkirsty.com slash podcast where you'll find information about the individual episodes. 